Good afternoon. My name is Gina Hunsinger, and I'm the museum director here at the Charles M. Schultz Museum and Research Center. And on behalf of Gene Schultz, the board of directors, and all the staff and volunteers, it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome all of you here today and those of you who will be watching this video online in the future. So if you ever wanted to know about Snoopy's adventures in space, the most recent ones, we have the four people on the planet who are the best people to talk about this here, right here on this stage today. Our moderator is Paige Braddock. She's the chief creative director of Charles M. Schultz Creative Associates. She was hired directly by Charles Schultz and she oversees the visual and editorial direction of all Schultz licensed properties for 24 years. She's illustrated several Peanuts books and she designed the US Poaches stamp in 2001 and she was our commencement speaker when we just launched the Charles Schultz commemorative stamp last year. She has won an Emmy in 2002 for the, uh, the Apple documentary, Who Are You, Charlie Brown? Anybody see that? And in 2023, the Canadian Screen Award for the Best Animated Show or Series, The Snoopy Show. Anybody on Apple TV see The Snoopy Show? All right. She not only has done that for Peanuts, The Snoopy Show is um, on Apple TV, so definitely check that out. Um, she not only has a, a large role in the Peanuts world, but she's also her own creator of things. She's an Eisner Award-nominated comic strip artist, Jane's World. She, author of the graphic novel, Stinky Cecil, and she has a children's book series, Peanut Butter and Crackers, which just won the Beverly Cleary Children's Choice Award. So without further ado, here is Paige Braddock. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, Gina. And um, like many of you in the audience, uh, I have always been fascinated by NASA and space exploration. Um, I'm also a cartoonist. So today's presentation combines two of my favorite things. I'm honored and humbled to be here as the moderator for this esteemed panel. And I'd like to take a few minutes to introduce the panelists to you. Mike. Hold on, first chair up. <laughs> Mike is a former NASA astronaut, a New York Times bestselling author, a Columbia University professor, a media personality, and the first person to tweet from space. <laughs> he, he's a four-time spacewalker on the final two space shuttle missions to service and upgrade the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, Mike also has made numerous television appearances, including one of my personal favorites, um, a reoccurring role as himself in the comedy The Big Bang Theory. Uh, Mike has hosted educational television programs and provides expert commentary on morning shows and network cable news programs. His forthcoming book, Moonshot, A NASA Astronaut's Guide to Achieving the Impossible, will be out in December. So thank you for joining us. Uh, sitting next to Mike is Charlie Blackwell Thompson. She serves as launch director for NASA's Exploration Ground Systems Program based at NASA's John F. Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Named to the position in January of 2016, Blackwell Thomas is NASA's first female launch director and oversaw the countdown and liftoff of NASA's Space Launch System rocket and Orion spacecraft during its first flight test of Artemis I. In her role as launch director, Charlie manages the development of all launch countdown plans, philosophy and launch and scrub turnaround procedures and schedules, as well as training approaches. Prior to being named launch director, Charlie served as the program's test management branch chief. She also served as the chief of launch and landing through the retirement of the space shuttle program before taking a leadership position within the ground processing directorate at Kennedy. Charlie joined NASA in 2004 as a NASA test director in the launch and landing division. She's been involved with the pre-launch processing operations and launch countdown since return to flight. She has received numerous awards, including multiple Space Flight Awareness Team awards, the astronaut Silver Snoopy for her work on the Hubble <laughs> Space Telescope, 
the NASA Exceptional Achievement Medal, the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal, and the Rotary National Award for Space Achievement Stellar Award. Thank you. <laughs> Melissa. I don't think you need to bother. <laughs> I was really, I was standing up here thinking, I'm really glad Gina read mine first. And <laughs> don't, don't believe a word Melissa says. She's amazing. She currently serves as the Senior Vice President of Marketing and Communications at Peanuts Worldwide in New York. In this role, she oversees major global marketing initi initiatives, a robust consumer communications program, and a highly engaged social media audience for Peanuts. Recent highlights include a partnership with NASA, that sent astronaut Snoopy into space with Artemis One, original and classic Peanuts, now streaming on Apple TV Plus, and the international multi-year Take Care with Peanuts initiative promoting good global citizenship, which I know that Jeannie Schultz is a big fan of, and was also inspired directly by Charles Schultz's comic strips. Throughout the course of her career, Melissa has worked on such iconic brands and characters as The Muppets and the Pets.com Sock Puppet, which I thought was, was really funny. Personally, Melissa and I have worked together for a little over two decades, so this is not our first panel together. <laughs> <laughs> for more than 50 years, Snoopy and NASA have shared a connection. NASA has had an association with Charles M. Schultz and Snoopy since the Apollo missions. Some of those connections only reside in Snoopy's imagination, but others are real. These two ink drawings were created by Schultz in 1969. Mike, I was wondering if you could talk for a minute <laughs> about, <laughs> about Peanuts involvement with NASA and if that affected you as a fan of Peanuts and a kid in the 60s and 70s. Did it affect your decision to become an astronaut? Uh, absolutely. Um, for, me, uh, for me personally, uh, the, the things that, uh, that stand out to me when I was six years old going on seven in 1969. Um, there were certain things that had a major impact on me. One was the, the space program, the moon landing, which occurred that July. Uh, I became a huge baseball fan. The Mets won the World Series back then in 1969. And uh, I thought that happened every year, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, and then I went to see a boy named Charlie Brown, which was at, at Radio City Music Hall. I grew up just outside of the city. And I remember going, it was one of my first trips to the city, was going to see a boy named Charlie Brown. But I, I th those are my three, pa and it's still, I, I don't think I've changed much since I was six. Uh, my wife can probably attest to that. Uh, <laughs> but those are my, still, still my, my, I would say, three of my, my three passions of what I, what I really love meant to me, very meaningful to me as a little boy. So when I was learning about the space program and, and the preparation for Apollo 11, I was learning about that and excited about that that summer. My brother brought me my Snoopy toy, which is on display now in the museum. Maybe some of you had a chance to see it. I, I think I, we have a photo of it have a in photo this. Of yeah. That. yeah. But I got that that toy when I was six years old, and uh, it 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 gave me a, someone to play with to, who also was an astronaut. So I was I had these backyard adventures with me as you know Neil Armstrong, and Snoopy was my Buzz Aldrin, and <laughs> and that's what I did. I just I I wanted to grow up to be an astronaut, and so. Uh, and the connection with, with Peanuts, seeing you know, Snoopy as an astronaut as a little boy and having that toy and pretending and playing and all of that. And then um, after I got to learn more about the space program and, and started working in the space program, I learned about the award that Charlie won, which was the, the astronaut Snoopy. That's, that's coming up. Snoopy. Do you want to mention? Oh, we're going to talk about that at some point? Well, I was just going to show these. These are some, some uh, NASA posters that featured Snoopy. Yeah, there you um, go. And then, yeah, I have a photo of the yeah. Silver Snoopy event. So, the Agency Silver Snoopy Award. How about if I turn it on? Would that help? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> turn it on. There we go. Thanks very much. See, tr see Charlie guys... sitting next to me has launched me into space and knows. She's not surprised by any of this. <laughs> So she knows, like, she would have everything, all the, I didn't turn to my own comm in the spaceship, did we? You didn't trust us. We, you had people do that, and we did all these comm checks, so, yeah, yeah. So yeah, anyway. Yes. Yeah, we should yeah. have had you do a comm check. We should have done it, yeah, because my, my mic was off, so. 
Yeah, but Snoopy played a huge role in my childhood and in my my dreaming about one day becoming an astronaut. And then, in a more serious way, the Snoopy Award um, is the highest award that we can give out at, at NASA, and it's an astronaut award, and it's given to one than one less than one tenth of one percent of the workforce. So very few people receive that. Um, I worked in the space program before I was an astronaut. I didn't come near getting that award. Um, I did get a chance to give many of those out, though, because we would fly those pins in space and then present them. And it was, it's always a very meaningful uh, ceremony when we got to do that. Usually families came. It was usually a surprise. I don't know what your experience was like. But it was the highest award you could get was the Snoopy Award. And the Snoopy Award, um, the history that I know about it is that they were looking for a symbol, NASA was, to raise awareness, safety, uh, safety awareness. Smokey the Bear was the symbol of the um, Forest Service. And so they contacted Charles Schultz, apparently. This is a story I've heard. I don't know what the conversation was like. But they, he, you know, they, they asked him to, to create an astronaut Snoopy for this award. But you received the award. What was that like? For you getting that. Well, I mean, it was absolutely one of the most special days of my career. And, and I feel like as a launch director and having worked Space Shuttle for many, many years, there's been a lot of those special days. But the day that I got my Silver Snoopy, which was for work on the Hubble Space Telescope, which is uh, kind of mine and Mike's connection because he actually worked on the Hubble Space Telescope in space. And I worked on the Hubble Space Telescope on the ground. And I actually uh, was presented the award. You know, it, it, it is presented for, to someone who has, and it's hard for me to see myself this way, but to someone who had an impact on mission success or flight safety. And it is a very treasured award. There's nothing, you know, today I got that award in the, gosh, it's probably been 20 years ago, and there's, there's still nothing as precious to me as putting that, that Snoopy on my lapel and, and wearing it, and I, I wear it routinely. Um, but it's very special because each of them flew in space. It is very special because it's given to you by a crew member, and it's usually a surprise that you're getting that <laughs> award. So, uh, you know, Snoopy is is a big part of of that for us. Not only a, the award, but I'll say for many in the workforce, that same connection back to their childhood. For me, the same, right? That connection to Snoopy and and exploration and all of that goes all the way back to my youth. And, that, um, I was going to say, I think for me, like growing up, I'm, I, I, and you know, people who are here to know me, I'm probably more identifiable in my real life with Charlie Brown. That's like kind of, I guess, who I kind of am. <laughs> but I'd like to think of me as an astronaut. I channeled Snoopy. When I was, when I was going through the launch pad, I was channeling Snoopy. Well, we have a little bit of Snoopy on our next slide. Um, Schultz created comic strips of Snoopy on the moon, capturing public excitement about America's achievements in space. Um, Schultz used to say, I heard him say, that um, the comic strip was a medium in which anything can happen. And he proved that when he drew astronaut Snoopy as the first beagle on the moon. So here he is. I'm on the moon. I did it. I'm the first beagle on the moon. I beat the Russians. I beat everybody. I even beat that stupid cat next door. <laughs> yeah. I have a few more strips from this week-long series of Snoopy on the moon. A lot of preparations to make. This is very serious. I'm really going to surprise everyone. They'll never believe it. First beagle on the moon. Here's the world famous astronaut taking off for the moon. All systems are go. A-OK. -okay. How do you read loud and clear? We have liftoff. The bird is beginning to move. We have a lot of in expressions. <laughs> Got to remember this was the 60s. Um, there's your hero, Charlie Brown, Mike. There he is. Uh, I'm glad you're going to the moon. That means I won't have to feed you tonight. <laughs> Report that man to mission control. <laughs> this is the world famous astronaut calling Houston control. Come in, Houston control, calling Houston control. All right then, how about Petaluma? <laughs> What's great about these strips is we're all invited in on this inside joke. He never leaves the backyard. He never leaves the doghouse. And yet, in our imagination, we see him on the moon. Yeah. That's like a bit of genius. Yeah. And for effect, it's a black space sky. 
Here's the world famous astronaut approaching the moon. Fantastic, it looks like a dirty beach. <laughs> or has someone already said that? <laughs> Here's the world famous astronaut returning from the moon, 240,000 miles through space. What courage, what fortitude. You can tell I'm returning because I'm facing the other way. <laughs> <laughs> One of my all time favorite gags. <laughs> A little bit of history. In May of 1969, Apollo 10 astronauts Gene Cernan, John Young, and Thomas Stafford traveled to the moon for one final check before the lunar landing attempt. The mission required the lunar module to skim the moon's surface to within 50,000 feet and snoop around, um, scouting for the Apollo 11 landing site. This, of course, led the crew to name the lunar module Snoopy. The Apollo command module was named Charlie Brown which I think is fitting because, you know, Charlie Brown didn't actually make it to the moon. One more in his long list of unrequited <laughs> wants. <laughs> I have a few pictures of Gene Cernan with Snoopy, Tom Stafford with Snoopy, the Apollo 10 before launch. That's awesome. Look, plus Snoopy's hiding out, getting ready to sneak on. This is Apollo 11. Neil Armstrong changed the course of history as the commander of the Apollo 11 mission, landing humanity on another celestial body for the first time, and fulfilling President John F. Kennedy's goal of landing humans on the moon by the end of the decade and returning them safely to Earth. Uh, Melissa, I know I just shared a few historical photos, um, but the partnership between Peanuts and NASA has recently gained momentum. Can you talk about the education initiative that Peanuts and NASA have embarked on together uh, and what's been accomplished by it so far? Sure, so in 2017, I mean, I've worked on Peanuts for so many long decades. Um, we've always had this relationship with NASA, but in 2017, my, my team and I were talking about what's coming up. I said, we should probably reach out to NASA because it's the 50th anniversary of Apollo 10 in 2019. Literally the next day, Paige sent me a voicemail from a woman from NASA saying the same exact thing. I called her and I said, yes, we definitely want to work with you on the 50th anniversary of Apollo 10. And she said, okay, why don't you go get permission to do that? And I said, I don't need permission to do that. We're going to do it. And she, no, please, please ask permission to do that. So I went to a weekly um, meeting that um, some of the family members of Charles M. Schultz attend. And I said, OK, so NASA reached out, and they want to work with us on the 50th anniversary of Apollo 10. What do you guys think? Craig Schultz, sitting right over there, said, why are you asking me? Of course. <laughs> So I went back and thus the Space Act agreement that we have now with NASA is to um, further the um, education of the exploration of space and it's made us be able to do a lot of cool things and later we'll see some stuff that I got to do that um, I only would get to do because I work on peanuts. Um, Charlie, just one more quick question. Can you tell us about NASA's commitment to space education and why it's important to NASA? Absolutely. You know, at NASA, we do some amazing things. And just like at Peanuts and at this museum, you do some amazing things. But we have some bold undertakings, right? We have the International Space Station orbiting above us now, where we're doing research. We have our return to the moon under Artemis. And just this morning, as I was flipping through the news, I saw that the Curiosity rover, right, after over a decade on the surface of Mars was making its steepest and most difficult climb and collecting samples and sending imagery back. And I think about all of that that this little bitty agency does. And it's, they're, they're, it's big, right, big undertakings. And while having scientific discovery, while having technology development, you're also inspiring the Artemis generation. And I see the Artemis generation sitting here in the audience. And so, you know, as part of that work, it's almost like self-feeding because we need science, engineers, explorers, astronauts to do all of those things. Like not just to do them today, but to do them for decades to come, right? Because the work at NASA is not done. We are just beginning this exploration of returning to the moon and going on to Mars. And so we need all of you 
right? We need all of you young people. And so our investment and encouragement of the STEM field is absolutely real. And it's because we need you. Speaking of future generations, <laughs> Uh, speaking of inspiring kids, I have this great vintage photo of Mike and his toy Snoopy from, how old were you in this photo? Six, almost seven. <laughs> is that a sailor's hat? No. Oh. So okay. that is, uh, uh, that is a Steve Canyon helmet. Oh, a plant okay. that I, that my, that was my brother's, I think, or one of my cousins or something. It was kind of a hand-me-down, beat-up Steve Canyon helmet. Uh, those are safety goggles I'm wearing that I got out of their basement. Um, I've got uh, some like medals that my dad had from, uh, you know, the army before the Korean War or something like this. Uh, and I've got and that gray. That, all right, so that flight suit is gray, right? <laughs> the reason why that flight suit I'm wearing is gray is because it's a converted elephant costume. <laughs> the first grade play, the year previous, we uh, we had a circus play and I was an elephant. And I ran across the stage, had no lines, uh, but I went across the stage as an elephant. And so my mom converted, I think she took the tail off the back of it, and we converted that into uh, an astronaut costume. And they had Snoopy, my co-pilot, with me. But that's, what, that's me dreaming, wanting to go to space. Dreaming and big. That was it, and uh, Snoopy was by my side. So that's, that's what I want to do as a, as a six-year-old. So between the first launch on April 12th, 1981, and the final landing on July 21st, 2011, NASA's space shuttle fleet flew 135 missions. I know because I looked this up on the NASA website. <laughs> yeah. um, and they helped construct the International Space Station and inspired generations, young and old. Snoopy's first actual flight to the space, to space was in 1990 when he was able to catch a ride on the space shuttle Columbia during the STS-32 mission. This is Mike and Snoopy in this slide on a 2009 flight aboard the space shuttle Atlantis. Did I get that right? That's right. Yeah. 2009 on Atlantis. So how did you sneak vintage Snoopy aboard the uh, space shuttle? Well, sometimes when you're getting ready to launch, the launch director uh, is distracted and doesn't, <laughs> you know, they don't know what the heck is going on. You know, you can get some. Um, well, for what, what uh, the, the thing, the, the connection with me and the, and the little boy dream and Snoopy, and that was very special to me. That was what I wanted to do in my, in, in my heart of hearts as a little guy. And then as I got older, I, Neil Armstrong was my hero. And as I got older, I realized I was never going to grow up to be Neil Armstrong. I uh, found out when I was about eight years old that I was afraid of heights. And I still don't like heights. <laughs> Charlie was telling me, we were at 195 feet when we would enter the shuttle. That was high enough. Now where are these characters going to be? The, 274. The 274 feet above the ground to get inside the spaceship. I, I, I would just look forward. I wouldn't look down and just keep walking. <laughs> but I just never saw myself becoming a, a, an astronaut like Neil Armstrong and those other heroes that you showed in that previous uh, Apollo 10 photo. Um, so I kind of forgot about it. And it really wasn't until. I was finishing up college, I went to the movies, I saw this movie, The Right Stuff, and that kind of rekindled it, and then I decided I had to be a part of it. I don't know if I could ever become an astronaut, but I thought at least I could do something to contribute. I was an engineer, and I wanted to do that, and I started to pursue the astronaut dream, and uh, I was rejected three times by NASA along the way. I re you know, it was two rejection letters, and I got an interview, and then they get to know you really well during the interview, and then they rejected me. And then I, <laughs> But I, I, didn't, I didn't want to give up. And on my fourth try, I, I got another reason I got picked in 1996. And so when you get to that point where you're going to be on the spaceship and it, it's, it's, a, it's a dream come true, you want to do things to kind of pay tribute to what got you there. So I took things from my high school and from my college and from my family members and so on. But I wanted to do something that was special for, for me in that journey that I took. And so the thing I wanted to take with me was this Snoopy I had as a little boy, dreaming about going to space. And the way I got it on was that we were able to take a few personal items in a special locker that we had on the space shuttle. And we're only allowed to, each crew member could take either one or two things. I was able to take my Snoopy as my allocation. I said, I, I want to, that's what I want to take with me. And, and uh, my, you know, my commander thought it was a good idea, and everyone liked having Snoopy kind of looking over our shoulder. 
the whole mission. But it was very special for me because I think that when, you, when you're when dreaming about doing something when you're a little a young person and you don't know if something's going to happen, and then along the way as you become an adult and you get knocked down a lot and told no and things don't always work out, you just got to keep going. And then if you get lucky enough that you get to where you're dreaming about going, I think it's really special to look back on the things that got you there. And so that's why, I, how could I go without Snoopy? Right. It really is. <laughs> and I'm glad we get a chance to share him here at the museum. So, so this is a photo of you on a spacewalk. It's, it's one thing yeah. for Snoopy to land on the moon, all from the safety of the comic strip, which is ink on paper and all in Schultz's imagination. But here you are in the vacuum of space with our planet rotating beneath you. All that separates you from an infinite sea of darkness is a spacesuit, <laughs> a visor, and a tether. Mike, how mm -hmm. do you conquer your fear in this situation? Um, well, <laughs> uh, you know, I said I was afraid of heights, and now we're up really high. We're 300, <laughs> 350 miles up. But uh, when I, I'm OK. Like, as long as I'm moving, I'm all right. So looking over the edge of a of a, uh, you know, a tall building or a bridge or something. I don't, I don't like that, but I'm okay as long as I'm Looking moving. Looking down at the planet doesn't matter. Looking down at the planet was okay. As long as I'm, that was too far away, it was, that was fine. <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, what I learned is that, you know, you, I, you, can, you can be worried, scared about different things. And uh, one thing I learned is that sometimes thinking about stuff is worse than doing it. When I was looking up at the, the rocket ship, my first launch, it was a night, it was a night launch 109. And, we're out, and there's no one around. They clear the whole area, of course. They, you know, Charlie and her team doesn't want anyone to get, get hurt, so they just put the astronauts out there with a few techs to put us in there, and the space shuttle is making noises. It's the fuel pumps. It sounded like it was moaning to me, and it was the middle of the night, so it was dark out, and smoke was coming off. It was just a water vapor, and I remember looking up at that spaceship thinking, after all these years of wanting to go to space, uh, maybe this wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> was I came, and I was scared, you know. So, uh, but uh, what I what I realized was I, it was too late at that point. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of security. This was a few months after the 9/11 attack, my first flight, and there was a lot of you know a lot of security SWAT guys out there and stuff. And I knew they would just run me down and make me go. So <laughs> I, you know, I didn't want to save that time sink. I just got on. And but once I got on, I was fine. And so I think one thing to remember is kind of when you're thinking about something. Sometimes you can, you're thinking about it as a lot worse than doing it. And uh, in our case, we were really well trained. You know, Charlie and her team, the team we had in Houston, were well prepared as well. And, and I knew that you, you trust, you have to trust people, right? And I trust Charlie and her team. I trust the folks that, that had trained us that were going to look after us during a flight. And, and that gave me the, the courage, I guess, to keep going. But we were so well trained and knew what we were doing. Um, it was years of preparation that it was really just, and my friends were there, we were going to take care of each other. So it was just, just execute the plan. You know, we have a good plan, now it's time to execute. We're going to run into trouble, we'll, fight, we'll try to fix any problems we might have. Um, but I, but I, felt, I felt really well prepared. And going out there and, and spacewalking was just glorious. It really was. It's cool when, you, when you're looking out the window of the spaceship and you can see the Earth uh, from that perspective through the window. But once you get out there, it's like now you're out in the schoolyard. You know, all the whole sky opens up. That's what I felt like. Now I'm outside and the whole universe opens up and you can see the planet on one side and you can see out into the darkness of space in the other and you might get a glance at the moon and it's just beautiful. Our planet is, is a beautiful paradise that we're living on. And so that was the overwhelming emotion. So by that point it was execute the plan, try to enjoy the view and and uh, fear wasn't going to help me at that point, so it was too late. <laughs> um, this next slide is, um, this was related to Artemis One, which was an uncrewed t flight test of the space launch system rocket and Orion spacecraft around the moon that launched in November of 2022. The only passenger on this flight was Snoopy as the zero gravity indicator. <laughs> Actually, I did see on the NASA site that there was a, a radiation duffel bag passenger, but Snoopy was the only recognizable pa uh, passenger on that flight. It was a moonikin, a moonikin. Yeah, huh? A moonikin. It was a mannequin that they called oh. a moonikin. Oh. <laughs> so I wanted to ask Charlie why, why this is necessary. Why is ZGI, zero gravity indicator, is necessary um, for an unmanned mission? Well, for an unmanned mission, I would say it's even more important than ever, right? Because what it does is it's a small item that you can place 
on board a spacecraft, and in this case, it was Snoopy Zero G was placed inside the Orion spacecraft, and so it gives you a visual indicator of when you have reached uh, the weightlessness of microgravity. So we could actually see Snoopy as we flew this mission, this 25 and a half day mission, you could actually see Snoopy as he floated through the Orion capsule. Um, Melissa, before, I, I have a video clip of how all this kind of came together, but before I share that, you had mentioned to me something about a conversation you had with NASA about a tether that I thought you might want to share. This is another example of NASA asking me to go ask people if it was okay, but I said it was okay. They, they called me to say that Snoopy had been selected as a zero gravity indicator. I was about ready to ship them a Hallmark plush, and they said, no, we need something new and, and unique, and so uh, we, we built this zero gravity indicator, and you'll see a video that tells a little bit about it, but I delivered him to the Artemis One spacecraft. I went up the elevator to the top of the spacecraft with Charlie, which I've been told is taller than the Statue of Liberty. And um, he was all set to go. And then a couple months later, I got an email. Melissa, could you please tell us if the tether on Snoopy's back can withstand 4G? <laughs> So, so they expect me to ask permission if Snoopy can be the zero gravity indicator, but they also think I know how to test for centrifugal force. Luckily, I knew someone who could do it, and I do have a video afterwards. It's not in this presentation, but if anybody wants to see the pull test, the tether lasted. I'll, I'll play the video now. Artemis is NASA's plan to go back to the moon, and Snoopy is to be the zero gravity indicator. He will be tethered within the rocket so that you can tell when it hits zero G. With every flight, the astronauts use some floating object to show them that they're in zero G. And for this flight in particular, because there's no humans on it, it'll be really important for NASA to get that visual of the ZGI. I knew that would be a challenge to make an outfit that got approved by the space agency. And I thought Martin Izquierdo is the perfect person to build the Snoopy outfit. I'm a sculptor and part of my life is working on small things, working on the costumes. We had to deal with the reality of it going into space, but obviously we're limited because of the scale. She rebuilt the legs and the arms because they were too short. So we added an inch and a yeah. half on, on the length of the arms and the feet. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had any room for the details that we do That's have right. now. This goes on and fits yes. in here. Yes. Inside, OK. The helmet is made out of a shape that's more like a wide incandescent bowl, whereas the visor is made out of a perfect globe of plastic and the complex curves of the helmet provided a challenge with how the visor would fit on top, not to mention the snout of Snoopy. And I love the challenge of taking these materials to create this unified piece. That makes it look a lot easier than it was. <laughs> <laughs> So this next slide is of the Artemis launch in November that Snoopy was on. And I was wondering, Charlie, um, can you tell us about the Artemis One launch and your experience in the firing room? Absolutely. I would love to share that. Um, so we did have a really important passenger on the Artemis One launch. We were thrilled to have Snoopy be a part of that mission. Um, you know, I have my own countdown for, for launch because if, how many of you followed the Artemis mission at all? How many saw the launch? Awesome. So you know we didn't go the first time, right? So I have my own countdown, uh, and it is, it goes something like this. Um, we had five <coughs> tanking events outside of launch um, to make sure that we had that loading uh, down. We had four wet dress rehearsals, which is where you try to get really low in the countdown. You know you're not going to launch that day, but it's all about testing everything out. We had four of those. We had three launch attempts. We launched on the third one. We had two hurricanes. <laughs> one we rolled back for and one we stayed at the pad. And then we had one outstanding launch and spectacular mission. 
Um, but it was a bit of a challenge. It was a first flow. And so one of the things that I learned after being in this business for 30 years is that when you are deploying a capability for the very first time, um, there are going to be challenges that you work through. And, uh, and this was all about a test flight. And it was about testing out the systems before we get ready for putting crew on Artemis II. But back to your question of what's it like in the firing room on launch day. So, you know, we test this hardware out. Melissa talked about being in the vehicle assembly building or the VAB when we did the turnover of Snoopy getting ready for the mission. That vehicle was put together, tested in the vehicle assembly building, rolled out to the pad for that wet dress campaign I talked about. And all of those days are great, but there is something special about launch day. And, uh, and on that day, November 16th of 2022, I remember, you know, we had gone through and we had had a little trouble with, with hydrogen and hydrogen leaks. And we had finally managed our way through that. We'd figured it out, uh, made some, some changes in the way we loaded propellant. And we came in and we did the, the, the loading of the vehicle with liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. And it was incredibly quiet in the control center that day. And, uh, and we got through the loading, and then we started hearing a little bit of talk, got down to T minus 10 minutes. That's our final whole point in the countdown. And we started having some discussion. I'm hearing on the back loops about a hydrogen leak at a replenish valve. And so a replenish valve is actually how you keep the, the tanks topped off with all of the commodity that you need to get this big rocket into space. And so we made a decision to send a team out to the pad to make that fix. And we came back and we're at T minus 10 minutes. And this was the first time in our launch campaign we had made it to T minus 10 before, but we were working problems. And I, I kind of knew that on those other attempts, you know, today's not our day. And we're going to launch when the hardware's ready. And on this day, on November 16th, we were starting to work through and we were a little bit behind on our timeline and we began to catch up. And I remember if you've seen a picture of the launch control center, there's kind of a wall from where the launch director sits and the NASA test director sits on the row below me. And I leaned over the row and I asked my NASA test director, how are we coming? Where are we at? And, uh, and started looking at where we were with what we call constraints, which means that there's an issue that we're holding the countdown clock for. And at T minus 10 minutes, we did that final poll for launch. And that's when the launch director says, this is the launch director performing the final poll for launch, verify no constraints and go for launch. And it was the first time on November 16th that I got to do that step, right? I'd been waiting on it, practiced it hundreds of times in a sim. Mm -hmm. And you get all of those goes and you give the final go to pick up the count. And the launch director gives the instruction to the team, you have a go to launch Artemis 1. Countdown clocks at T minus 10 minutes and counting. The room is incredibly quiet. You have 100 engineers in the firing room, and they're all focused on their system. Because between T minus 6 minutes and T minus 1 minute 30 seconds, you can only hold the countdown clock for three minutes. So if there is an issue that comes up, you have three minutes to resolve that. Or we're going to recycle and figure out if we have enough window left to make another, make another try. I looked at that countdown clock that's up above me. I looked at that thing probably 100 times between T minus 10 minutes and counting and T minus 6. I did not think four minutes could take so long. <laughs> at T minus 6 minutes, I hear the GLS operator start to make the, again, the entire room is quiet. It's the intensity of the moment. Um, was palpable. The GLS operator comes over the comm loops and at T minus five minutes says, GLS is go for FTS arm. FTS system is the flight termination system is arm. T minus four minutes, we are go for APU start. APUs on that core stage, that massive rock, the core stage is that bottom part of the rocket. The APUs are up and spinning. We are terminating the cryogenic propellant to the vehicle. The flight tanks are getting pressurized. The team, again, is continuing to monitor that vehicle. T minus two minutes, we begin transitioning systems over to internal power. T minus one minute, 30 seconds. All of the vehicle elements are on internal power. We have no, no whole time left. And I remember that day, we had what we call cutouts in the launch window, which are time periods in which you can't launch. And we had about 50 of them. And I had a sheet of paper in my lap that if we were to hold the clock 
inside of that T minus six to, to double check the countdown clock that we were good to pick up. And I remember when we hit that T minus one minute, 30 seconds, and I knew we weren't gonna hold the clock anymore. I tossed that sheet up on the desk and I looked over at my assistant watch director and I said, we're not gonna need this today. <clears throat> T minus 33 seconds. We do the handshake between the ground systems and the flight systems and at T minus 31 seconds, the onboard flight software takes over control of the vehicle. And then a few seconds later, you hear the call, GLS is go for core stage engine start. The countdown clock is at T minus 10 seconds and counting. Then shortly after that, those core stage, those four engines are stagger started. That vehicle, you talk about coming to life, it's coming to life on the pad. And then five, four, three, two, one, booster ignition and liftoff. And that mission and Snoopy, right along with it, was on its way to the moon. We were, we were talking a little bit before the, because I'm such a nerd, I was like halting them on questions before we got down here, but you mentioned that this was the first time in a launch you actually felt the floor move when with liftoffs, because that's- Yeah, when you have, when the vehicle lifts off, there's this huge sound wave that comes off the pad, and if you're anywhere along the Space Coast, like during the shuttle missions, you could feel it. And one of the things that happens, like a little known fact maybe, is that, as that sound wave comes off of the pad, the windows in the launch control center will shake and you will hear for a few seconds, you know, this vibration of the windows and you'll feel that pressure, you know, even push against you. Well, for the first time ever, um, as we stood in the, in the launch control center and you watched this, you know, 8.8 .8 million pounds of thrust, that vehicle coming off of the pad, not only did you get the shake of the windows in the launch control center, but I could feel the floor move beneath my feet. It was, uh, it was something, it was something <laughs> special. <laughs> I have the next shot I have is actually footage from our, the Artist Moon mission. Um, wow. This one of the moon favorite. and earth. From space. Um, I remember when NASA shared this photo on social media, and it was the most frightening photo I have ever seen. <laughs> see the Earth? <laughs> when I see this, this is one of my favorite photos oh from gosh, the mission. Oh my gosh, this photo scares me to death. I'm, I'm wondering um, if you could Poor tell Snoopy. us. You, I know. <laughs> so far from his supper dish. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if you or Mike could talk a little bit about um, what do you hope to le learn from this mission, like this unmanned mission, and then anything else you can tell us about Artemis. Yeah, so I'll take a shot and then I'll hand it to you, um, Mike. So let me say, this is one of my favorite photos. And to me, it's my favorite photo because it is what exploration is all about, right? This is the Orion spacecraft, our home planet, in the kind of far away. On the other side of the on moon. On the other side of the moon, <laughs> yes. But when I look at this Artemis generation that is here, I think about what will that body be in your, in your time of exploration, right? Where will you take us, right? We're going to the moon, we're going to Mars, but where else will we go? And to me, this is what exploration is all about. It is that there is something between you and your home planet. And what will that be? So what is Artemis about? Sorry, I, you know, just, cause this is oh, one of my okay. favorite, favorite photos from the 25 and a half day mission. So what was Artemis one was all about testing out the flight capabilities. You can test on the ground and you can do some incredible things on the ground. But at some point in time, you got to see how this vehicle flies. And so Artemis One was a test flight, and it was about testing out that SLS rocket. How does it perform? You know, think about all these separation events that have to happen as part of the mission, right? Two minutes into the mission, boosters work are done. They're going to be jettisoned, right? Core stage, eight minutes into the mission, work is done. You're going to jettison that. Um, you're going to take your upper stage. It's going to give that final push to the moon, and then you're going to jettison it. Just in separation alone, there's a ton of complexity. 
but there's also the performance of each and every piece of flight hardware. How did it perform? And let me be, I want to tell you, if you haven't read it already, all of the flight hardware performed amazing. Um, we ended up adding flight test objectives midway through the mission because we were able to achieve the, the flight test objectives. I just happen to have this inside shot, so I thought while you're talking, oh, I would just yeah, show that totally. too. And so Artemis One was that was the test of that performance of the vehicle, um, testing out the rocket, how did we perform, and then Artemis Two is about flight crew and adding the flight crew um, to the mission. And so it'll be all about those crewed systems, checking those out. It'll be about demonstrating rendezvous and proximity operations, which is when we have to dock with the human lander system on Artemis Three as we prepare to go to the surface of the moon. Um, I, a, I actually have a, I have you, you're next up in this, Mike, because. Okay. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, just talking about, you know, crude uh, flights, I was going to ask um, how spending time in space influenced your outlook on life. Um, what did you discover about yourself? What surprised you? Just talk a little bit about that, Mike. Sure. Yeah. Just to add on to the Artemis thing, it's it's very gratifying to see that we're we're getting there at this point. And I just want to point out, this is my astronaut class patch. So we have a lot of patches at NASA, and so this was from 1996. And so when we designed this, we designed this. My entire astronaut class designed this together, more or less. These are the things we thought we were going to be doing as astronauts back in 1996. So we have the space shuttle, which a lot of us I got to fly on a couple of times, and most of my my classmates did. Space station, right? We got there. And then you notice the moon and Mars. We thought that one of us might be going to the moon one day. And uh, that, that didn't happen. Well, we saw it, so few of my, my classmates are there. But um, it's taken a while to get to where we are now. And it's, it's something that we always thought, well, when are we going to go back to the moon? This happened when I was a little boy. It's been 50 years since we've sent people there. When are we going to get people to go back? And now we're, we're doing that. And uh, Jessica and I, my, my wife and I, were lucky enough to have dinner with the, the crew, the Artemis II crew. Reed and his crew were in town in New York, and we got to have dinner with them when I saw them. It was right after they were announced. They were in New York for, for a, uh, an appearance on Colbert, I think, or something like that. Anyway, when I saw them, I was like, I am so excited for you guys. I, I, and I, I said, you know, it's strange, but I'm, I think I'm more excited about you guys getting assigned than when I got assigned to one of my flights. And he goes, Mass, I understand, because I'm excited about what we're doing, but I'm going to be even more excited for the next crew that gets to land. land and so I think for all of us at NASA that have been a part of it, this is where we thought we've been headed for a while, and now we're, we're right there. So it's a very exciting time, very meaningful to, to everyone. I think the whole world, and it's not just going to be a US accomplishment. I think that, uh, and that's maybe one of the things that I learned in space, <laughs> that you know, we're, we, all kinda, we all share this planet, and we all, no matter where you are, there are certain things that you can share together. And um, the, the, the astronauts that went to the moon during the Apollo program, they were shocked that when they went to other, this is what they've told me, when they went to other countries around the world, it wasn't like the Americans did it, which of course they did, but it was more like we did it, the whole world did it. And I think that's something on this level, on this scale of going to the moon again, with people, and Snoopy maybe too, uh, <laughs> is gonna be the kind of thing that, that I think will will be very, very important to a lot of people. What I learned in space, I think that uh, I learned a lot about as an astronaut, I learned about teamwork and leadership and all kinds of cool things I never thought I'd learn about in, in the way that I did of how important it is to be, a, be an important team uh, like Charlie and I have been a part of. Um, I think what I've learned about our planet is a couple of things. One is that we're living in an absolute paradise. Uh, it looks, I felt like I was looking into heaven when I looked at our, I can't imagine any place being more beautiful than our home planet. And I think of that, and I think of our, when I walk around it now, even though I don't see it from that perspective, that's the way I think of it, that we are very lucky to be here, that we're living in an absolute paradise. And then the other thing that I learned is that my, the change that changed for me was my concept of home. Um, when I, I, I mentioned I grew up in Franklin Square, Long Island, that place was my home when I was a kid. So if you, if, if you asked me in my early years, 
up until maybe going to college or so, where I was from. I was from Franklin Square, that's where I was from. When I thought of home, that's what I thought of home. And then after college and going around the country a little bit, maybe working, I thought of myself as a person from New York. I'm a New Yorker. That's how I started to think of myself I'm from that part of the world. And then as an astronaut with the American flag on my shoulder, I think I thought of myself as an American. You know, I'm going wherever I'm going. I'm an American. I'm from the United States. But now what's changed, when I think of home, I think of Earth. I think of that's, that's where I'm from. And going around it is, I haven't, there's a lot of places I haven't been to on the ground. <laughs> I've seen a lot of stuff, but I haven't got a chance to, a lot of places I haven't been yet. But, uh, but I, I, I've, I, my connection with home now, in my mind, is Earth. And it's a place that we all share, no matter where you're from. Throughout this planet, we all have that in common, that we all share the same home. So those are some of the ways that, that my space flight experience has altered the way that I think about things just about every day. I put yeah. a slide above the um, space station. And Melissa, I remember you saying that Snoopy had also been aboard the International Space Station. I thought we could just give a shout out about that. Yeah, Snoopy's been also been in the Macy's Parade more than any other character, which is another thing for him to brag about. But in 2019, in honor of the 50th anniversaries of Apollo 10 and 11, we launched astronaut Snoopy in the Macy's Parade. And someone from NASA said, I think we can get a Snoopy up to the ISS, and maybe the astronauts up there can record a message that can be aired during the parade. I said, well, I have to ask Macy's. Um, of course, Macy said yes. Um, so there is a, a Snoopy in the exhibition upstairs that was on the International Space Station um, in honor of the launch of the astronaut Snoopy balloon. Who took his last flight last year? Sorry. Um, this is the Hubble telescope. And I wondered if Charlie could tell us like a little bit about that. Telescope. I mean, it took a lot of great pictures. I don't know what its mission statement was beyond that, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll talk a little bit about it, and I know this is also near and dear to Mike's heart, so I'll, uh, I'll hand it to him as well. You were there from the but, beginning, though. But yeah. I, uh, I had the opportunity to work on Hubble. I remember when I started at Kennedy, and I hate to put the years out because I know you guys will do the math and then, you know, kind of like with, with Mike and you'll figure out, wow, she's pretty old. But, um, <laughs> but I started at Kennedy in 1988 and I was right out of school. And I remember there was all this talk about this amazing telescope that was to come. And a few years later, that amazing telescope came to Kennedy and that was Hubble. And we were processing it, getting it ready. And so when I think about Hubble, um, I don't remember the mission statement per se, but what I would say about Hubble is that Hubble changed the way that we see our universe. It changed our understanding. It helped us see it and see it differently and see it in color and in this magnificent beauty um, like we had never seen before. And I think about as I was a young woman and we were getting ready to to launch Hubble for the first time, and then the servicing missions that were to come. And then, you know, now I have grown children, and I remember as they studied science and they went through different curriculum, how I would see the pictures that came from Hubble um, as part, and I think, you know, how it really changed the way we see our solar system. Um, and so to me, Hubble was absolutely amazing. And then you look at the images that are coming from James Webb Space Telescope today, and you realize that there is just so much to learn. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's just incredible. And so Mike, having worked on Hubble, I'll hand yeah, it over. Yeah, no, I was, I was uh, thrilled to be a part of those missions. Uh, my two spaceflight missions were both Hubble. The, the, there were five missions to service the telescope. There was initial launch, and then they serviced it five, we serviced it five times. I was on the final two of those. And uh, it was a great team to be a part of, both of course, Charlie's team to launch us and the, the folks who trained us and controlled the mission from Houston during the flight and then all the people that, the, that uh, got us ready, the engineers that built all the tools and uh, it was just a great team to work with. Um, it's a, I, look at, I look at the telescope I, and I, I, I see a, a, an engineering wonder of what it's able to do. It, it provides us great science because of the great engineering behind it. One of the things, for example, is that its gyroscopes 
are able to hold uh, the position of the telescope very accurately. It's traveling 17,500 miles an hour, which is really fast above our planet. <laughs> but it's able to track a star or whatever it's looking at, a, a galaxy, a star field, a, a you know, wh whatever it's looking at, all these beautiful things, these images that you see, the way we're able to get those is because the Hubble is able to point so accurately while it's moving that fast, it can keep a steady image going, a, a steady shot as if you had a, a, a pointer, a laser pointer, uh, in, on the Empire State Building, you could hit a dime on the Washington Monument. That's how accurately it, point, it points. It's, and it was designed to be serviced by astronauts, so we were able to take pieces of equipment out and put new ones in. If something wasn't working any longer, if new technology came along, we could upgrade the telescope. So it's an engineering wonder as well as what it provides scientifically. And what, what I, think is cool about it. There's many things that are cool, but um, Charlie mentioned the beauty of the universe and, and, and what we've learned. Um, one of the things that I found out was that they learned stuff they didn't even know they were gonna, looking for at the time. So they knew, like they kind of thought black holes were out there. So they said, well, let's point Hubble. And they found black holes with, with Hubble. And they thought, oh, we think there's planets and other solar systems. And they found them with Hubble. But they knew to look, they knew they wanted to look for that stuff. But some of the other stuff is they didn't, they didn't even know what they, they had no idea what they were going to find. And they found, for example, dark matter. They were able to do calculations, uh, the way that light was bending, gravitational lensing is what it's called, where light will actually bend due to gravity. You can calculate the amount of mass out there. And they, and they realized they couldn't recognize uh, like 90% of the matter in the universe, which is why they, they call it dark matter. And then they were trying to calculate the expansion rate of the universe, because they knew we had the Big Bang Theory, not the TV show, but the theory itself. <laughs> and the universe is expanding, and they wanted to calculate that rate of expansion. And they thought it would be slowing down. You throw a baseball, and it's going to slow down and hit the ground. And what they found was, when they first did the calculations, it came out to a negative number. And uh, Adam Reese has told me this story. One of the, he ended up winning a Nobel Prize for this stuff. And he says, well, how, how could it be negative? What it was is they were looking at it uh, in the opposite effect of what was, the, what was actually happening. The, what was happening was, was opposite of what they were thinking. It wasn't slowing down at all. It was actually accelerating. So it's like you took a baseball and threw it, and instead of slowing down and hitting the ground, it actually started to increase in speed. It started to speed up. And that's what our universe is doing. They have no idea why this is happening, but they, that's, that's what they call dark energy. Um, that discovery was made through Hubble. And uh, so that's what I, I think is, is really the mark of a great science instrument maybe, is that it doesn't just answer questions that you're trying to answer, but it gives you other questions you could never even have the imagination to, to think about asking. This is a video you sent us <laughs> yeah. of sort of an example of zero gravity. Could you, I, we can watch this and then maybe, yeah. or you could talk over it about what it's like to be in zero gravity. Yeah, so I think this, what's, what's it like to, this is my friend Drew Feustel, who just retired from NASA, uh, my crewmate, but here he is, you just, just look, at, look at this, he's making a sandwich in space. <laughs> shot of Earth. And then I yeah. had this um, sort of our last slide before we open up for questions is this uh, mm -hmm. us. so when you see those pictures of you doing your spacewalks and you see the Earth and that one from, you know, Orion, you just see black space. There's just, it's just dark. And then you see this photo and you're like, whoa. Uh, this happens to be a, a, a star field part of um, uh, Alpha Centauri. So this is one of the early release images from the telescope where after my second mission. They, they take some, uh, some uh, images just to make sure the telescope is working, and this is one of those. So we're looking at a star field that each one of these dots that you see there is a star, like our sun is a star. And there's 100,000 of them in this one frame. 
uh, part of a larger star field with over 10 million stars, and that's only one little section of the sky. So that's is an example. I call it like the big picture. You know, this is there's so much out there, and it's, I think it's important to keep the the big picture in mind, both when you for astronomers and everyone, but just in life, try to keep in mind the big picture, what you're doing, why you do it, things that are important to you, and, and whenever I feel like I'm forgetting those things, I try to remember this image, the big picture. So. That. Um. We're just a little bit over time, um, but we also started a few minutes late, so I wanted to give the audience a chance to ask at least a couple or three questions. Um, if anybody has a question, raise your hand. We have a microphone floating around out there. Jessica can find you. Oh, Aaron Samuels has a question. I can repeat it if you don't want to hand the mic over there. Oh, okay. She's coming. It kind of uh, relates to what you were just asking or pointing out with this. When you're in space and you look out, do you just see blackness or do you see stars? Because every photo is black. Yeah, it depends on how much light is sort of around you. So um, like from the cabin, if you turn down the cabin lights, uh, when, you, when you're over the, uh, uh, the sunlit part of the Earth, uh, which so it's sun's out right now, right over California. So we would, if we're flying over California now in space, we look at the Earth and we would see a you know, very beautifully lit uh, Earth. Um, when we, especially at nighttime, though, when we get when it's now we're out of the the, the sun is not shining. Uh, but when you see the sun in space for the first time, I realized I was looking at the sun in a black sky, which is kind of cool. So the sky is black, the sky is blue because we're looking and seeing looking up through the atmosphere. Um, but the stars in space, uh, they don't twinkle. They're perfect points of light. It is, the, it is like the most amazing planetarium you could ever imagine. You see all of them, all the constellations, everything. And so they don't twinkle. The reason that stars twinkle is because the light is being uh, distorted through the atmosphere. Uh, so Twinkle Twinkle Little Star was written by someone on Earth. <laughs> more than anyone in space, because they don't, they don't twinkle in space, they're perfect points of light. And that's the advantage that Hubble has, is that it's above our atmosphere. So looking at the, universe, looking at the stars um, is kind of like look, being in a pool and looking up to, through the pool water, trying to, you can't really see, we've got water in our eyes, you can't really see what's going on. As soon as you get out of the pool, everything's much more clear, right? And that's the same thing that the atmosphere sort of does to our ability to see stars on Earth. So when you get to space, and you, and you can see them as these perfect points of light. They are, they are just beautiful. And you can see the different colors. You can see the Magellanic clouds, the clouds of the Milky Way. Uh, it is just amazing. It never gets old. It's just beautiful to see that. The moon was really cool, I thought, too. Because to me, like the moon, the moon, when I see it from Earth, it's kind of like two-dimensional most of the time, you know? And it's kind of bright sometimes, or maybe dark. But, but in space, you see it in three dimensions. And you can really clearly see the, the, the craters and the grayish color. And it's just really cool. It looks like a basketball hanging out over there. And it's that, so that was cool. And, but the star, you know, the star, we're not that much closer to the stars. I mean, the stars are really far away. And we're a few hundred miles closer from low Earth orbit. When the moon, they'll be a lot closer to them. But still, even that, they're so far away. But you just see them more clearly. So that's the biggest difference in, in being able to look at the sky at night. A little, little trivia side note, the, the person that asked that question, Erin Samuels, also worked mm -hmm. with Mr. Schultz. She used to do the color on the Sunday comics oh, cool. with Sparky. Cool. Give her a little Thank shout out. There was a question in the back, I think. Um, so th this is a technical question about Mars. So everyone talks about terraforming Mars. Um, but the thing that they never seem to address is the fact that Mars doesn't have a molten core. And so there's no magnetic shield protecting it from solar wind. So, you know, Elon Musk talks about dropping nukes on, on the poles and, and releasing the water vapor and creating an atmosphere. But wouldn't that, something like that, just be stripped away by the solar wind? I can take this one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> w well played, Melissa. <laughs> Mike. 
Do you want to uh, Whatever you want me to. <laughs> what are we talking about? New, we're going to send a nuclear weapon what, what to we Mars? Do on, what do we do on Mars about the solar winds? Uh, well, I think it's just that you're exposed. The radiation exposure is huge, yeah. So that's a, that's a real problem. Um, we're lucky here on Earth for a few, uh, a few different reasons, of course. With all this life we have here, it's, we're at the right distance from from the sun, and we're not too hot and not too cold. We got to be careful with the temperature. That's a whole other story, right? The global warming, climate change, and all that. But we also have a magnetic field, which I think is kind of what you're referring to. So the magnetic field around our planet shields us from a huge amount of radiation. You still have to be careful when you go outside, and it's bright. Always wear the, the sunscreen is important. Um, but the higher you get away from our planet, the more you're exposed to that. In space, you're very exposed. Hubble was 100 miles higher than where the station is, so we even got a larger exposure. In fact, my Snoopy that is here on, uh, on display was on display at another museum. No, you know, no jealousy here, but, <laughs> but a few years ago was on display at the museum, the Intrepid Museum in New York, where, where I live now. And when I delivered Snoopy there, uh, they asked me, you know, they called me up and said, you know, it seems like he's gotten a lot of, uh, it seems like radiation damage is, is they, had a, they were going to help him out. He had a broken leg and his tail had broke. It is terrible to say this. But they had to fix him, my toy. And, then, and they said, we, we haven't seen you know, this. It seems like he's had a lot of, you know, is he exposed to a lot of radiation? I'm like, well, yeah, we were up at that Hubble altitude and he was there with me. And they, they go, that's it. And they go, oh, OK, we just want to know what it was. And I, and I hang up the phone. I go, what about me? <laughs> you know what I mean? I was there with them. You know, I'm like, what the heck? No one said anything, Charlie. I, you know, sometimes you don't want to ask questions. You know, like, what? Is something? But, uh, so, but so when you're out in space and it, with the crew going to the moon, it's going to be even more exposed to, uh, to a, a solar event, to, to that radiation. So no, on, on Mars, certainly. Uh, that's why we, we were pretty sure there's no sign of life on the surface. You know, there's this hope that maybe we can find signs of ancient microbial life you know, somewhere fossilized underneath the surface where maybe something might have existed at some point, you know, whenever. But, um, but that's one of the things that, that we have on Earth that makes it so special here is we have this, this magnetic field to protect us. Um, I don't think, you know, how about to recreate it with that, whatever that's, those, I don't know if that's possible. I think it's more figuring out ways to protect us, just like you're going to have to protect that crew going to the moon. Yeah, and I would say, you know, it is all about understanding and, and then mitigations for that. And, you know, you talk about the difference in radiation of a low Earth orbit mission versus one going to the moon. And you spoke about Munikin Campos and some of the mannequins that we had on board. And they were on there for a very specific reason. And that was for understanding the radiation environment and specifically on soft tissue. Uh, and, uh, and so all of that data was part of getting ready to fly crew to the moon. And so as you think about going to it, whether it's Mars or a different destination, it is understanding um, about the environment that you're sending the crew into, and then what are the systems that we have to have to protect them, and what are the, the systems that we, have to, that we have to deploy to get there. And so part of all of these exploration efforts, it is, it is research, and then it's also about the, um, like the robotic missions. If you think about Mars and all of the data that we've gotten off of Curiosity and the suite of rovers there, it's understanding that environment before we send humans there. I just have to add something about Snoopy because he mm. went around yeah. the moon and I picked him up at Kennedy Space Center. Um, from I got to drop him to Charlie and she gave him back. I was terrified putting him into my closet in the <laughs> East Village in Manhattan when I got back because I was like, what if an alien like is inside Snoopy? <laughs> I didn't really think of radiation, but I was worried that there was an alien in him. But. <laughs> He's in the museum now, so. <laughs> um, What's that? I don't think we, this panel, we're not going to answer that question on this panel, are we? <laughs> That's a good answer right there. Yeah, no, I don't, we can maybe talk later about it. But, yeah. um, I think we are out of time, or do we have one more question? could do one very last question. Okay, one last um, question. And then I'm going to let anyone know if you have a question that you didn't get to ask, um, you can, we're having tables outside, 
Mike, Charlie, and Melissa will all be outside, as will special guest Snoopy. So you can head on out um, to ask questions out there. We have Mike's books for sale, and he is going to be gracious enough to sign them. So uh, please go ahead after the talk and ask any question you didn't get to ask out there. And yeah, we, we have, have very one, last question. One question on the front row. <laughs> OK. So about like how t people are saying like colonizing Mars and saying like there's evidence of water. Are there other uh, chances that there are other places where we can colonize if let's say like global warming is coming by habits to the earth and we can go there? Are there life forms on other places or is it just here because the, the Mars is in like uh, somewhere, the safe zone where we can live? So the, the near-term plan, right, is to go to the moon and then on to Mars. But I would look at you and I would say, you tell us where we're going to go after Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, right? It is, you know, to, to take a, a page out of the, the Snoopy comic strip, it is a, it, it's, blank, it's a blank slate, right? And it will be the Artemis generation. It will be young people like you that will determine where we go after Mars. So it's not limited to Mars. There are no possibil there are no limitations, right? All possibilities. Uh, and so the reason that Mars is, is the next destination is if you think about going to low Earth orbit, right? We can get there in hours. Um, you go to the moon, it takes days. And you have to learn how to live away from your home planet that takes days to get there and days to get back. And communications are sometimes delayed. You think about going to Mars, it's you know, nine months to a year to get there. But is it the final destination? No. No, it is not. I, um, I have one last slide I'm going to share, which is a photo of oh, cool. Jeannie Schultz. Um, on April 5th, 2023, NASA Administrator Bill Nelson presented Gene Schultz with NASA's Exceptional Public Achievement Medal in Washington, D.C., recognizing Schultz's role in continuing Charles M. Schultz's legacy by building on the relationship between NASA and Peanuts Worldwide. The Exceptional Public Achievement Medal is awarded to people who are not employed by the government and whose work contributes to the NASA mission. So I just wanted to give Jeannie a shout out. That's really great. Thank you to our panelists, and also thank you to the museum and the museum staff for hosting this event, and the end.